Well, thank you all for coming out tonight, and I'm left to welcome you to Cleaning Up Vermont Yankee, Three Perspectives. This is being sponsored by the Safe and Green Campaign, and we're very grateful to uh, Professor Jeff Unsicker of SIT for uh, donating the space this evening. So, those of us who've been involved in Vermont Yankee issues for decades recognize that these next years coming up could be the most difficult um, of any of the times that we have spent working on this issue. We don't really have a voice in the process that's discreet and distinct. And we need to kind of wiggle our way into the process to make our voices heard. So tonight is the beginning of educating ourselves on decommissioning, learning what we can um, from folks who are both experts in the field and have experience with decommissioning other reactors. And then taking that information, thinking it over, talking with each other, and then making our voices heard to those who are negotiating our future and perhaps the future of future generations in Wyndham County, in Franklin County, Massachusetts, and in New Hampshire. So we're going to start off the evening with Tom Buchanan from the Wyndham Regional Commission. And Tom's put together a really great um, presentation for us that includes him talking a little about, bit about himself. So I'll let him do that. Well, thank you very much. Um, my name is Tom Buchanan. Let's see if I can get the first slide up there. Uh, I'm a commissioner with the Wyndham Regional Commission, which is a party to the public service board process here in Vermont. Um, I chair a couple of committees that develop policy for the Wyndham Regional Commission. The executive board then implements that policy. Since 2007, I've been engaged in the case, uh, partially as a witness before the Public Service Board in technical hearings, and I've uh, participated in the uh, cross-examination of witnesses and written almost all of the briefs that we've filed. So that's my background in the case. I'm primarily focused on the Public Service Board process on behalf of the Wyndham Regional Commission. We neither support nor oppose continued operation of the plant, and never have. Our focus has always been on what happens when it shuts down. So we've positioned ourselves pretty well for this point. I'll be speaking today as an individual, not on behalf of the Commission. Uh, the Commission speaks through its Executive Director, so I can tell you what we've done and why, and I can tell you what I think we should do and why, but I can't tell you what we will do, and I can't speak for the Commission. I have quite a bit on tap today way more than we can actually fit into the time allotted. So I've cut everything back. You'll find a lot of uh, slides in the handout, which is over on the table, uh, will not be available in the demonstration today, uh, but they'll be available to you. I have a couple of points here that I'm not going to cover. These last two, I think we'll handle those pretty well during the discussion instead. So that's the plan for today. And I'm going to start out with a tour of Vermont Yankee. I want to start with an aerial picture of the plan. I want to give you a sense of the landscape, how big it is, or really how small it is, about 148 acres. You can see the Connecticut River up there on top. That's kind of the, the landmark. And this is the site boundary. So this is the land that we're talking about. The main production facility is right here, and right next to it are the cooling towers. I point that out because they're a really big piece of the landscape. Uh, they cover a lot of land. And it's a critical piece of the land right there if we think about how much might eventually be available for redevelopment. Entergy plans to remove those cooling towers as part of the decommissioning process and site restoration, but they're not planning to take away the pipes and tunnels that are below those towers. So there are pipes, there are storage tanks, uh, and other elements down there. Entergy plans to simply remove everything above the surface and then down to three feet if it's not radiologically contaminated and everything else will be left behind. So the radiologically contaminated material comes out, everything else only as far as three feet. That's Entergy's plan. Uh, we think that's a problem in terms of redevelopment of the land, and if you look at how much space is taken by the towers, you can probably see that's true. Over here we have one of the switch yards, and there's a second switch yard here. Both are owned by Velco, and we believe both of those will continue to operate after the plant shuts down. They support the northeast power grid. 
That's important to us for a couple of reasons. First, they occupy so much of the land, and they're owned by Velco, so that will not be redeveloped as part of the, the energy plan. It's also important because they provide power. So this piece of land is unique in that it has great access to the river, great access to roads, to a rail line, and to industrial grade power. Finally, the switchyards are important because Velco pays property taxes, a lot of property taxes. They actually pay more in property taxes than Entergy does. That's pretty interesting. So when the plant shuts down, Vernon will suffer because they'll lose the property taxes from Entergy, but they're nicely buffered from Velco, and that wasn't the case just a few years ago. So that's a big positive. So here's the site in a little closer, and I'll point out the reactor building. This is important, a um, couple reasons. First, it's really big, and it has a really big foundation. It goes down to about 50 feet below the surface. It's actually poured concrete right into the bedrock. When the plant shuts down and is decommissioned, Entergy plans to remove the components here that are radiologically contaminated, but they're going to leave anything that isn't contaminated below three feet. Now think about how big that building is and how big the foundation is and how far down it goes. Definitely that would have an effect on the land and how it's reused. The other important thing about the reactor building is this is where the spent fuel pool is. So spent fuel pool, as I think probably everybody here knows, it's about seven stories up the top of the concrete structure. Um, and right now it has about 2,600 spent fuel assemblies in it. There are another 300 plus assemblies in the core. All of that will move into the spent fuel pool. The most recent fuel will need to stay there for about five years to cool down before it can be moved into casks, which is what we hope Entergy will do. But they haven't made a commitment to do so. In fact, some of their filings have said that they might not. So that's important to us. When the plant shuts down, that reactor building needs to be protected because the fuel will be in that pool. It's possible for them to decommission and restore the rest of the site around the reactor as long as they can isolate that piece. That's one option that they have available to them. This is the turbine building. It also has a deep foundation. It goes down about 40 feet into the bedrock. Again, a really big foundation. And if you look around, you can see all the other buildings, most of them with foundations. If they're below three feet and not radiologically contaminated, that will stay behind. We have a water intake structure here and a discharge structure over here. And we have pipes and tunnels that connect them together. Those pipes and tunnels are deep and big, about 35 to 40 feet below the surface. Some of those tunnels are big enough for a man to walk through. They're huge. The ones that are less deep than 20 feet, closer to the surface, would be broken up and then buried in place, filled and buried in place. The ones that are deeper than 20 feet, Entergy plans to simply cap and leave in place. Look how much land that takes up and what that might do to the redevelopment of that property. So I wanted to point out the spent fuel pad too. If you look carefully at this thing, you can see eight dots lined up on the left side of that pad. Those are casks as seen by a satellite. Pretty cool. Right now there are actually 13 casks on the pad. It's sized to accommodate 36 casks. When the plant eventually shuts down, there'll be enough fuel to fill 58 casks, they're telling us. So the pad obviously isn't big enough. Most of us have known that for quite a while. Entergy's plan has been to build a second pad, a bigger pad, to accommodate all the fuel, someplace up by the, uh, by the switch yards. The idea was move all the fuel up there, because if it's stored right here, it would make it difficult, expensive, or potentially impossible to decommission the site. So that's been Entergy's plan. Well, they've changed their plan in the last year or so. Their current plan is to build a smaller pad right next to the existing pad. We don't know what that will do to the cost, uh, complexity, or potential to decommission the site, but it's a concern. It's an especially big concern because right now they may not even have, the Public Service Board may not even have jurisdiction to authorize a second pad. So we don't know what's going to happen with that. As we think about that issue, though, it's important to consider that there are a lot of fuel assemblies in the pool in the reactor building. If we make a big stink about where the, the fuel might go, where that pad might be, Entergy could shrug its shoulders and say, to heck with you all, we'll leave it in the pool. So there's a lot of strategy that has to take place about where we put this fuel or what we advocate with regard to where this fuel goes. 
So that's a, a quick overview of the structures around the building. Key takeaway from that segment, it's you, not... I'm sorry. Yep. Could you go back to that slide? Let's see if I can. Tom, do you want there questions during or after? Um, if there are questions that pertain to a particular slide, I'll take them during. Uh, but we don't have a whole lot of time. I'd rather have the questions at the end. So, uh, 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 I'm just wondering where the off-gas building, and that was the sure. scene of the, the tritium leaks, as I understand. Right? This would be the off-gas building right in here. Tritium leak was right around here, uh -huh. and it went into this area. Uh -huh. There was a second smaller tritium leak someplace over in this area. Well, so the site isn't very large, uh, but if decommissioning is managed well, much of the site can eventually be returned to productive use. The next piece of it is standards for decommissioning, and I'm going to go through this pretty quickly um, and not cover a whole lot of technical. There are two components to standards. There's radiological decommissioning handled by the NRC, and there's site restoration that's controlled by the state of Vermont. The NRC requires the licensee to do its best to reduce radiation to the lowest level they can within reason. Um, that standard is called a LARA, or as low as reasonably achievable. So the way Entergy goes about this, hopefully, will reduce the radiation to as low as reasonably achievable. If they want to release the site for unrestricted use, they also have to hit 25 mil around. So that's the NRC standard. It's possible if they apply the LARA principle, they may get that down even lower. It's also possible for Vermont to require a higher or lower level of radiological <coughs> contamination cleaning. But right now, what they've got is 25 millirem plus Alara, and then the EPA, through the NRC, will control other contaminants that might be there. So the NRC doesn't care about buildings like that. Once the radiation is removed, they can leave all of that behind. So they can leave blown out or beat up buildings like that, giant piles of rubble, trenches, pits, whatever's there. The NRC doesn't care. But the state of Vermont does. When Entergy bought the plant, it agreed to a greenfielding standard. That's kind of the shorthand we use. Uh, but the standard isn't greenfielding. The standard is the re removal of all structures and, if appropriate, regrading and reseeding the land. That doesn't sound like what you saw in the pictures, does it? No. So WRC has been asking the Public Service Board to require the removal of all structures regardless of depth. We think that's important uh, from a standpoint of redeveloping the land. We recognize that some of those structures may be so deep that they aren't a threat to redevelopment of the land. And we could potentially later on trade some elements for other pieces of decommissioning or, or site restoration. For example, a lower radiological standard. So that's why we're asking for the removal of all structures. Uh, it's good for redevelopment and it's a potential way to gain a little bit of muscle in the process. So the NRC only regulates or requires radiological decommissioning. The greenfielding of the site uh, is a state requirement, and the specific terms are in dispute. They're before the Public Service Board right now. So when does all this happen? Most of this you guys probably know. Uh, the fuel that's in the pool has to stay there for about five years. Entergy has said all the fuel could be removed after five years. Uh, they're expecting about five and a half years for that process in many of the filings. So that part of the land or that, that building needs to be protected for five years. The rest could be decommissioned immediately and restored immediately. But the NRC requires that it be completely restored within 60 years. So the process has to be finished in 60 years. Entergy's filings tell us that they're planning on a 54-year period of safe store from a financial standpoint, and then they'll complete in 60 years. Once they shut down, they'll have two years to file a couple of reports, a series of reports with the NRC. They could actually file these reports tomorrow morning if they're available, or they can just delay the process and file them at the end of two years. Once the NRC gets those, they'll look at them. The reports need to outline their plan, the timing, and how they're going to pay for it. The NRC will hold a couple of public meetings about those plans, but they're generally very deferential to the licensee. So in order for us to have any kind of effect there, we really need to approach them together uh, from the bottom as a, a grassroots uh, contingent, but also from on high, uh, from Congress and from the federal government on, 
there someplace. So if we're all speaking the same language, carrying the same message, we may have a little bit more influence there. Now, Entergy could choose to, put the pl to decommission the plant right away, or they could put it in a safe store for 54 years and finish the process within 60. They could do it in a shorter period of time, too. Safe store doesn't have to be 60 years. They could even decommission part of it right now, put the rest in safe store, and then decommission the rest later on. That's up to them what they decide to do and what they tell the NRC they want to do. But it certainly appears some period of safe store is probably inevitable. That's because Entergy doesn't have the money to decommission right now, they don't want to decommission right now, and they have that two-year window before they even have to deliver anything to the NRC. So from my standpoint, the best we can really hope for is a short period of safe store followed by complete decommissioning. So Entergy is going to file a decommissioning plan. The NRC will give them two years for that, and then the public will have an opportunity to comment. So that's that segment. This is our last segment that I'm going to talk about, and that's the decommissioning trust fund. It's a big one, and I'll start out with a big number. It's the latest value of the fund at the end of October, $598 million. That was a month ago. It's probably over $600 million now, and that's actually really good. They started out with $310 million back in 2002, so it's roughly doubled in value over that time. I think that's a pretty good performance. It's done well in real terms, and it's done well relative to inflation. But that's not assured in the future at all. If we look at that graph, you can see that it fell apart in 2009. We've recovered well, but it could see another drop in the future. There's nothing that tells us that fund has to continue to grow at this rate. It could lose value. It could lose value in real terms, or it could lose value relative to inflation. So if inflation is high, that's just as bad. Once the plant shuts down, Entergy will need to take some money out of the fund. So you'll see a dip once it shuts down and they take some funds out to start the safe store process. And then they'll have to take money out every single year to maintain it in safe store. So the fund will have to grow sufficiently to beat inflation, cover the costs of safe store, and grow enough to eventually decommission the site. That's a tall order, and I'm not sure it can happen. So how much is all this going to cost? Well, Entergy has presented a number of different budgets. Generally, they come out in the range of about a billion dollars to do the full decommissioning and site restoration. That's their number. I think they're probably a little bit low, and I would guess from this room, y'all think so too. So when I, when I look at this budget, it's broken down into three categories, license termination, spent fuel management, and site restoration. The license termination piece is probably a little bit low, primarily because of the cost of disposal of low-level waste. So we heard a lot of testimony in the public service board process about how they're planning to dispose of the waste and how much they think they have to dispose of. They're really low on all of that. So this number will probably go up by a bit. Right below that, we have spent fuel management. That's about a third of the cost. And most of that will probably be refunded by the Department of Energy, which actually has responsibility for the spent fuel. But not all of it. The Department of Energy is very specific in what it will refund and what it won't. And that's been determined through litigation primarily. So we'll get some of that back, not all of it. Um, what we get back will depend to a large degree on what we ask them to do. They won't fund everything. For example, uh, they have, the Department of Energy has refused to fund or refund the cost of building the, uh, the wall around the existing spent fuel pad. So things like that might not be refunded. The last piece of this is site restoration. And Entergy has that pegged at about $48 million. WRC has looked at that in great detail, and there was a lot of testimony in the Public Service Board process that tells us that number is incredibly low. The Department of Public Services witnesses think the cost of site restoration alone were ranged between about $94 million and $125 million. Mm -hmm. That's just to do what Entergy wants to do, that is, clean the site to three feet below the surface. If they're required to pull out all the structures below three feet, that number would go up by $100 million. So we're really looking at site restoration that could cost as much as $225 million. And what Entergy has budgeted here, just $48 million. So clearly there's a problem there. 
So what happens if the fund isn't enough? Well, we've got Energy Corporation, the parent that we all know about down in Louisiana. And then we've got the owner of the plant, Energy Nuclear Vermont Yankee LLC. It's a limited liability corporation that owns the plant and the decommissioning fund and nothing else. They don't have any employees. They just have a board of directors. And they contract with another energy entity called Energy Nuclear Operations, or ENO. ENO is incorporated. They hire the workers that run the plant. They sell the electricity off to another energy subsidiary, which in turn sells it out, to, out into the market. Energy Nuclear Operations also runs other plants, so they operate other plants. They have additional income streams. When the plant shuts down, Energy Corporation tells us that only Envy has any responsibility here. And all they have is the decommissioning trust fund. So if it isn't su sufficient, the only thing they can do is leave the plant in safe store cross their fingers and hope that it goes up rather than down. That's hugely risky. Every single day that plant is in safe store, there's a risk of loss of fund value, unless we have a deeper pocket or somebody else with responsibility. So WRC has made a great effort to try and require joint and several responsibility. That's what we have asked the Public Service Board to do. So we've asked the Energy Corporation and ENO jointly hold responsibility for all costs associated with decommissioning. I'm not sure what we're going to get out of the Public Service Board there. My guess is that we probably won't get joint and several responsibility with Energy Corporation. Uh, there are three holding companies between Envy and the parent company. Energy Nuclear Operations, on the other hand, is a co-holder of the license with the NRC and a co-holder of the Certificate of Public Good. And there's only one shell company between them and Energy. So we're really hoping the Public Service Board at least gives us access to energy nuclear operations because they do have ongoing revenue and can potentially help with the cost of decommissioning. So the takeaway from here, trust fund has performed well relative uh, to inflation and in real terms, but it might not be sufficient to restore the site and we can't bet on good performance in the future. Unless additional funding sources are secured, any additional costs charged to the decommissioning fund will delay the point at which the site can be decommissioned and restored. What that means is if the legislature, for example, decides to pass a property tax on Vermont Yankee, that tax would probably come out of the decommissioning trust fund. So that would deplete the fund and take longer for the fund to grow to cover the cost of decommissioning. Or alternatively, it might make it impossible to decommission the site. Same is true if we have higher standards than what Energy is planning on now. That could delay the point at which the plant can be decommissioned, or it could make it impossible. Likewise, if we ask things for, uh, in terms of spent fuel management that the DOE doesn't reimburse, that could delay the point at which we can decommission and restore the site. So there's a lot at stake here. And that, I think, is all I want to cover today. And say so thank you very much for listening, and hopefully we can, help, we can answer some good questions later on. So the questions for everybody will be at the same time? Well, we can take five minutes of questions okay. at the end. Right now, we have enough time for the five minutes. Yeah, I went fast. Specifically on this. Yeah. Yes. Hey, okay. I have a question I've had for a while, but it seems like no one seems to have an answer, which is what if you know we get to the point where they don't have the money, which it seems very likely, is there a legal mechanism for that? Will the state have to go to the rate, or will the state obviously have to go to the rate payers, which is what it seems um, like? Not so obviously. Uh, there are two components here. First, there's radiological decommissioning, and then there's site restoration. Energy assures us that if they get to the 60-year period of safe store and there's not enough money, the NRC will go after Energy Corporation and will be able to pierce the, yeah, exactly. So that's Energy's argument. They don't even make an argument that there's any way that the state can get to Energy Corporation. So it, it's an empty shell. There's really nothing we can do in 50 years or 40 or 30 unless we solve this issue now, which is why WRC has been so focused on joint and several responsibility. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah. Not, I mean, not the way you wanted to answer. Oh, no, I, and I didn't expect that. I just think it's something we need to emphasize. It, it, what bothers me here is that I've seen that issue for about six years. The Department of Public Service hasn't really advocated that at the state level, at the Public Service Board at all. Um, so WRC has been out in front on that pretty much alone. Um, and I think it's one of the most important issues we have. Uh, as I look to decommissioning and site restoration, 
I see it in two categories. First is, how do we get the money for it and the responsibility? And then second is, what do we ask them to do? Uh, and when do we ask them to do it? We can ask for anything we want, but if we don't have money for it, if there isn't responsibility, then those questions are kind of moot. So we have to deal with the responsibility and the money issue first. Yes? Checking something, did I understand you to say that Delco pays more property taxes than Vermont Yankee? You did indeed. Okay. The treasurer of the town of Vernon told me that Yankee pays just under 50% of Vernon's property taxes, so I'm having some difficulty reconciling these two facts. <laughs> Delco pays a little bit more than Entergy, and then there's a little bit more coming from other places. So Entergy does pay less than 50, and it is a little bit more because there are other payers as well. But Velco actually pays more than Entergy. Of course, there's other. This is not an argument, but of course, there's other people. There's the folks who live in Vernon who pay property taxes on their houses and so on. Mm -hmm. Yep. So are we saying that they're paying something like 10 percent of Vernon's uh, total budget? They're paying very little relative to what the others are paying. Yeah, a total percentage. They're paying very little. And that really bears looking into because that's not the public information that's being about. Um, I can probably have the number that, Vern, that Velco is paying, and it might even be in a report that Vernon has. Let me look for that a little bit later, and I'll see sure. if... By the way, I'm, sorry, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm clarifying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we covered that issue in the technical hearings of the Public Service Board process with the, the engineer re or the uh, economist representing Entergy. Um, and he was floored when he learned that. Entergy asked to strike the report and strike that data point. We argued otherwise. The Public Service Board said, you know, we'll let it in because the chairperson of the Vernon Select Board will be testifying in a couple of days. And if Entergy doesn't like this data, if they find that it's wrong, they can bring that up with her on the stand. Entergy was dead silent on that issue. Um, so that's where I think that one stands. And I'll be happy to show you what I have if I've got it sure. in my bag right. later. Yeah? So um, why should we care so much about site restoration? I understand that the, uh, the switch yards, the, the Velco equipment is valuable. Um, but that equipment, won't that equipment be valuable whether the site's restored or not? Sure. So, so what, what's the big deal about site restoration? Um, a couple of things that I look at there. Number one, it's valuable industrial land that employs a lot of people, and we would like it to employ people in the future. Now, WRC doesn't see that happening in a year or 10 years, but long term, nobody is going to make any more land on this planet. In fact, there'll probably be less land in the future. So it's important that any land we have be redevelopable. Second, I really look at it as a matter of... Um, I think the, the technical term is intergenerational equity. Where we've made this mess, we've damaged that land, we have a responsibility to the next generation to clean it up. Um, intergenerational equity, kind of a big word. I also think about it as the kindergarten rule, where you clean up your own mess. So that's the other big reason for site restoration. Uh, I understand your desire to be optimistic in terms of this land being reused for economic, the economic value of the mm -hmm. state and the community. But I think the reality is, uh, un un unless the spent fuel, the casks, are removed from that site, the, the setback requirements from that spent fuel, the casks facility, will not allow for any development. Am I right? In the short term, you're right. Uh, yeah. The spent fuel will not stay there forever. DOE will take it so, someplace. So the future use is contingent upon the casks being removed. Is that yeah, right? and whether they go to Yucca Mountain or not is the, I don't know. I don't think that's yeah. going to happen. But enter, the Department of Energy is responsible for those costs. And economically, it makes sense for them to consolidate fuel in fewer locations. So we think that fuel will go away uh, at some point. One of the other things that I look at there, um, is that right now we have a policy of removing fuel in the order it was burned. So the oldest fuel goes first. That would mean they take some fuel from Maine Yankee, some from Vermont Yankee, some from Indian Point, all, all over the country, and then go back through the cycle. They also have an opportunity to take fuel from decommissioned sites or shut down sites first. 
So that's probably what they'll wind up doing, taking it from the shutdown sites first, so there'll be priority there. If DOE looks at the economics of this, they may actually choose to remove the fuel from fully decommissioned sites before sites that are in safe store, because economically it makes sense for them to do that. So I think the sooner we get the thing cleaned up, the more likely we are to see that fuel moved away. Um, WRC has also been advocating for Entergy to do a better job of shifting that fuel someplace else. They have a, an MOU commitment to use their commercial best efforts to move the fuel off-site and out of Vermont. They have other sites that they could take it to, other Entergy sites, and they've made no effort to do that. So that's a real concern for us. So we, we recognize the problem with spent fuel. It is a problem, but we're also looking at this long term, not in five years or ten years, but in a hundred years. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you all very much. And now we're going to hear a lot more about spent fuel and about how it gets to be spent fuel um, from Dr. Marvin Resnikoff of Radioactive Waste Management Associates. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, my general critique of Tom's slideshow is not about the facts so much, um, but about the politics. Uh, because Entergy has said something in the CPG hearing or they, before the Public Service Board, they make a decision one way or the other, that's not necessarily what's going to happen in the end. Because this is a democracy, uh, there are activists and uh, who will uh, be concerned about all this. When Peter Shumlin was elected governor, he won in the first election by 1% of the vote, but 14% of the vote was uh, concerned about Vermont Yankee. So we have Peter Shumlin's back on this issue. Uh, and if Entergy makes a decision which is going to leave the fuel at the site forever, essentially, uh, because 50 years is a long time. Envy has been in operation for I don't know how long, since 2002 or whatever. Uh, if they make a decision to leave the fuel at the site uh, and leave all, uh, the, the plant sitting there for 50 years, uh, that's going to concern a lot of people, not just in Vermont. There will be public service boards all over the country that will be concerned about this. Uh, and there will be activists all over the country, and it will affect the nuclear industry as well. If they leave a site which is just contaminated and just going to sit there contaminated for 50 years. So, uh, my, my concern, again, is not with Tom's analysis, not so much with the facts, but the fact that there's another player out here, which, which is the public, uh, and they will have a, a role in decommissioning this site. Oh, I was going to talk about decommissioning, right? <laughs> All right. All right. I come to, I come to this whole uh, from a personal perspective. I come from this all uh, from a skeptical perspective. Uh, I first started looking at nuclear issues at West Valley in 1975. Uh, and I at the time worked for the New York State Attorney General because they were flying liquid pl plutonium out of Kennedy Airport and the State Attorney General at, in containers that were designed to withstand a 30-foot drop. <laughs> and most people except the NRC knew that planes fly higher than 30 feet. Uh, but eventually we got them to design containers that could withstand an airplane crash like black boxes can withstand an air crash. Uh, and that was a directive to the NRC uh, from Congress, who in an appropriations bill in 1981. So the NRC has their own opinion about what should be done, but one can influence the NRC. 
and we did in you know in that particular case another one that i'm more familiar with is uh, also familiar with is uh, decommissioning itself in 1978 i gathered some uh, engineering students at suny buffalo uh, to look at decommissioning and we noticed that there were some radionuclides there that would be very long-lived uh, and the industry had said nothing about it um, like nickel 59 nickel 63 and then a colleague of mine at uh, Ithaca in Cornell said niobium 94 and then the industry started to change originally they said reactors could s sit there for 300 years and be taken apart and there's no problem with radioactivity uh, but after that the industry changed uh, and actually science magazine gave us credit for changing the direction so this this is sort of where I come from my skepticism about the NRC and also about the role that the public has in influencing these decisions okay here I go we're gonna talk about decommissioning okay this is a boiling water reactor in simple terms here is the reactor core built up steam steam turns the turbine then that steam is cooled and goes back into the reactor core that's a simple uh, view of a boiling water reactor what happens over time is wherever neutrons are present uh, all parts become radioactive so you have concrete which has rebar in it which has iron then you get iron 55 concrete you get calcium 45 uh, you have carbon steel which ha which is much more radioactive those are units of curies per cubic meter so concrete 3.8 this comes from our NRC documents uh, steel 370 curies per cubic meter but that has cobalt 60 in it there which has a half-life of five years calcium 45 has a half-life of only half, half a year so in five years ten half-lives the level of calcium 45 declines by a factor of a thousand in five years uh, the spent fuel pool, as Tom mentioned, uh, sits up in the air over here. Uh, when the fuel is removed from the reactor, the cover is taken off, the fuel is moved under water into the fuel pool. And also, when a reactor is decommissioned, that entire area is flooded. And all the well, and one can't do that until the fuel pool is emptied uh, because there would be nowhere to take the hot parts that come out of the reactor. So... What do you mean flooded? What'd you say? What do you mean flooded, Martin? Oh, all, all of this would be flooded. This part here. When you take the fuel out of the reactor, there's water sitting up here and the, and the fuel goes right underwater to, to uh, the fuel pool itself and when the, the reactor is decommissioned uh, this area is flooded and it, it's all taken apart underwater how soon after shutting the reactor down well as Tom mentioned the, fu the hottest fuel has to be taken out of a fuel pool after five years uh, there's not fuel which is called high burn-up fuel uh, this is boiling water reactor fuel so it has to cool for five years before you can actually store it in a cask out on the storage pad else the fuel would get too hot inside the cask so you have to wait a five-year period before you can actually even get to the point where you de take apart the reactor and Deb will argue probably you should wait a little longer <laughs> she's such a patient person I know <laughs> um, <clears throat> I should mention that 
the 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 method for decommissioning a boiling water reactor has some precedent and much more than when they took apart yankee row which was sort of a novel kind of plant um, all of this work with the hottest components could be done under water um, in the reactor itself the parts are extremely radioactive uh, as i mentioned as I showed here, now you're talking about millions of curies per cubic meter. You're talking about doses that are over three rems an hour. Uh, these doses are extremely high. Background radiation is on the order of 100 millirems a year. And here we're talking about dose levels that are on the order of three rems per hour. So it's extremely radioactive. Uh, and you can't really have workers standing next to unless the, this is underwater. So the closer you get to where the, the fissioning takes place, the hotter the parts are that you have to deal with. This shows radioactivity as a function of time for some of the parts. Uh, for the most radioactive parts of the reactor. You can see for cobalt 60, you start with on the order of a million curies. A, a curie is a, a large amount of radioactivity. A curie is 37 billion disintegrations per second. That's a lot of radioactivity in one curie. And here we're talking about a million curies when you just shut down the reactor. And after 20 years, while well, it declines by, well, the half-life of cobalt-60 is five years, so four half-lives is on the order of not a million, but now you're still talking about several hundred thousand curies of radioactivity, so it's still hot after that period of time. Tom pointed out there, there are two methods. One is to safe store, which Entergy would like. That is, let the, let the reactor essentially sit for 50 years and then take it apart, hoping that the decommissioning fund increases sufficiently. Not meeting inflation, that's not the issue here. You have to meet the cost of decommissioning not the cost of inflation. Uh, and the NRC has consistently, as I'll show you later, consistently underestimated what the cost is to decommission a reactor. Or you can just dismantle the reactor as soon as possible, which has to be at least five years uh, after the reactor shuts down. This is what Connecticut Yankee now looks like. It has 40 casks which contain the nuclear fuel on the left. It has three casks on the right, which contains the hot components of the reactor itself. Vermont Yankee has operated for a longer period of time and should have components that are probably hotter than Connecticut Yankee. I should also mention that the cost to decommission Connecticut Yankee was double what originally was estimated. This is what a cask looks like. The fuel is put inside that lattice work, slipped into these slots, and then the, ca the canister is sealed, and then the whole canister is put inside the concrete overpack. That's, so that's what it looks like out on the pad. I call it the Stonehenge concept of waste disposal. Uh, there's another method which is lies the cast horizontally, new homes system, which they're not considering. Well, that's the first cask. <laughs> that's a wine cask for me. <laughs> but this is what it would look like if the casks were transported. This is a high star uh, transportation cask. I should say, uh, you know, 
in the interest of full disclosure, I do work for the state of Nevada on transportation issues. Um, so I have a prejudice along the slide. Before Entergy bought uh, the Vermont Yankee reactor, it was owned by several utilities. Uh, and those utilities contributed to a decommissioning fund, which an entity hasn't put a dime into it. Uh, and the, the, the utilities w promised to put in additional money into the decommissioning fund. Uh, and then they sold it to Entergy, uh, and with the growth in stock and bond investments, uh, the fund has, uh, has grown, um, as Tom pointed out, but not enough to take apart the facility. Uh, now, one issue has been uh, the actual cost of uh, taking care of nuclear fuel itself. Uh, this money, according to TLG estimates, has to come out of the decommissioning fund, but they're hoping then the Department of Energy will reimburse the, the energy uh, for the money they take out. And it has not been the experience of other uh, court suits with the Department of Energy that they will get all the money back. Uh, I was out in uh, San Onofre uh, recently, and the amount of money that they're getting back is on the order of 78% of the total cost. So it's not chip change. I mean, it is... In this case, if it were 78%, it would be on the order of $50 million in addition that has to go into the decommissioning fund. Well, this points out the estimate, this is one estimate of the decommissioning cost itself, uh, plus $51 million. The NRC has estimates of of how much it should cost to decommission in the plant. Uh, and I put here a slide which shows the difference between NRC estimates and what's actually in the fund. Uh, as Tom pointed out, because the stock market went down in the year 2008, Entergy missed the mark, the amount that they're supposed to have in the decommissioning fund by $200 million. When you come to 2012, they're still off by on the order of $75 million compared to the NRC's estimate. And, and I would argue that those estimates are low. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Of the funds that are put into the decommissioning fund, is there any estimate, any stricture, or any requirement that a certain percentage of those funds be used to um, abate the high-level nuclear waste danger in any way, shape, or form? Well, it's all in one pot. I, I don't under quite understand the question. Well, uh, my, my, my fear is that they will, um, energy will, um, tear down the buildings, uh, create something like what you see here at Yankee Row, but we still have the long-term waste there. Meanwhile, all the money's been spent. So what do we, what do we ha finally do when we can get rid of that waste, and how do we do it? So well, as I said, they're going, that's a, a legitimate concern, uh, that there will not be enough funds. And because this is a, because entity, because Vermont Yankee cannot go back to ratepayers, it's a merchant plant, they just sell electricity, you know, uh, to other utilities, um, they have no particular ratepayers themselves. They cannot go back to anybody else, except if somehow they can pierce the corporate veil and get the money from Entergy itself. Um, which, you know, as you've seen how litigious Entergy is, this could be years in attempting to get back that money. Um, as I said, they. DOE will get will reimburse them for three quarters of the cost of because under the standard contract the utilities are required to pay for actually packaging the fuel 
So they have to, the utilities have to pay for this canister, and they have to pay for putting the fuel into the canister and moving it out to the storage pad. And at that point, the Department of Energy would pay for the rest of it. Uh, Department of Energy would pay for the concrete cast, and so they would get that money. They would get that money back, but there would be a delay. According to TLG, there'd be a three-year delay before they could finally get the money back, and that's a hit on the decommissioning fund. Yes. Okay. These are estimates of the cost to decommission, but then you notice it, it takes a precipitous drop in 2006. <laughs> It's perhaps a coincidence that when Entergy purchased the plant, they also purchased the company that makes these estimates, uh, T TLG. This is a slide that I borrowed from, uh, uh, which shows the original cost to decommission the facility and these later costs to decommission a facility. These are just for uh, the state of Pennsylvania. But as I said, Connecticut Yankee, the, f the cost to decommission were doubled, uh, the, the, the estimates. So these are my suggestions, uh, that while the labor force is there, action should be taken toward decommissioning a facility. Uh, there are many things they can do before they finally have to take apart the plant. They can find out exactly how much radioactivity is on the site. Uh, they can do it, the Vermont should be doing an, an economic audit of TLG uh, better than they have in the CPG hearings. Um, I'm very concerned about the safe store, uh, that the financial risk is too high uh, and there has to be sufficient funds to dismantle the reactor. If, if it turns out that this doesn't happen, you know, uh, if Vermont taxpayers have to pay the bill, uh, you know, for decommissioning this facility, I think they'll be held to pay. Uh, that is to say, uh, I can see concerns by public service boards all over the country, I can see uh, a tremendous hit on the nuclear industry itself. Yeah. So it's not just a Vermont problem, uh, it's a problem which will reverberate around the entire country. Okay, you got questions? I, I have a question. We have, we have about four minutes of questions. So I have a question. You say here, Vermont <coughs> must do an independent economic audit what about an independent site evaluation to figure out how much tritium is there and other contaminants? Exactly. Might be below that, the that's exactly. That should be done. Okay. So is that what you mean by the economic? The no, no. Th that's what I meant by site immediate survey. steps must be taken. Uh, oh, we need a site survey. We need a okay. site survey. Okay. Yes. Yes. Commissioning fund. Who's the custodian of the assets? Who makes the decisions about how it's going to be invested, its allocations, and then is there like a publicly available, you know, an annual report or something like that, like you would have for a mutual fund? You go and read and see how it's invested and this sort of thing. No, you can't see how it's invested. The the only way I've seen how it's invested is to actually see how. The utilities invested in it before Entergy took it, took it over. There you can see uh, more specifically, you know, what stocks were and what um, bonds were in the fund. But I, Tom can correct me, but I don't believe you can actually uh, go look over the books like that. There's been an attempt so by it, there's been an attempt by the AG's office to actually do that, but I don't think that's been very thorough. In my opinion, could I step in there? Um, the Public Service Board did see some testimony on that, and they had the custodian of the fund actually testify. So there are some uh, uh, exhibits that will tell you how it's invested at particular points in time. I may have those on my computer if you try and hit me up at the end. 
um, but it's looking back in time. We don't know where right. it is right now. And is the custodian independent? Um, they are, but they work for Entergy. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, what, no, what I'm saying is Entergy hires an independent oh. company, okay. so they don't. It's not like TLG that yeah. is a subsidiary of Entergy. Gary, you were going to ask a question. Um, I think the question I was going to ask. Thank you. Uh, it's somewhat off the. Uh, you did a really good presentation. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you know, thanks. Can you answer me one question, Marvin? <laughs> well, you, you found, found the question. question. Yeah, I found the, a question in all that I had. The leak rate testing. Can you please clarify for me what is the value of the helium leak rate tests? In addition, I would clarify for you. Say it again. What is the value of the helium leak rate tests that were not done on the Vermont Yankee casks? In addition, I would point yeah, out to you true. that what we have for our steel liners inside our dry casks those are not transportable. Yes. So that means it has to be transported yeah. into a DOE right. sanction. Right. Bill? What, what, okay. I, I'm not so, uh, a little unclear about the last point. Uh, the, the canisters themselves, okay, right. can be put into a transportation right. overpack. Okay. There, there is a, uh, an overpack that will take the cask out of the concrete mm -hmm. cask mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and move it over to uh, transport transport overpack. How much that history? canister. How much history? What'd you say? Are we transferring high-level waste over the railroads in this country today? Oh, well, that sounds like a uh, Yeah, that, that, there's some... There's well, there's nowhere to take nuclear fuel right now. But the Navy has taken fuel to uh, Idaho, but there's otherwise there's no place to take the fuel, so that hasn't transported. And the tests for this kind of you're standing next to me, I'm getting nervous. <laughs> the tests for this kind of cask are all by computer simulation, not by actual tests. Um, I don't know whether. So, so that is to say that there, none of those inner steel casts have been lifted and put into transport casts. That's right. That's right. Thank you. The, the, the slide that I showed, though, is actually the, the, the transportation overpack they would, they would use on the railroads. There's one other problem at Vermont Yankee, which is the tracks. Just one? The, tra <laughs> the tracks have been removed uh, because other things have been put on the site. Uh, so you can't just roll a train over, well, not like Metro North, you know. Uh, you, can't just, you can't just roll a train where there's no track. You'd have to actually clear, clear it in, or you'd have to put it into some kind of uh, heavy haul truck, which brings it to the local you know, railhead. Have you studied the Finnish approach and what they're doing in Finland with the high-level waste, and do you think there's any promise for that to be done? Here? I haven't studied the Finnish approach. Okay. I've looked at and been into the tunnels in Sweden, uh, which are similar, okay. uh, where, the, where essentially the tunnel goes under the Bering Sea. Um, How deep? I, I'm not reassured by that <laughs> prospect either. Right. When I was there, you know, inside the tunnel, there were actually rivers that were sort of flowing on both sides of the <laughs> roadway mm -hmm. because there is leakage under the sea, you know, mm -hmm. into this. Uh, they, ha they continue to have motors that pumped out the, mm -hmm. but those motors won't be operating once they close it up. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a little uncertain about that too. But at any rate, that's not what's being looked at uh, in the United States. Uh, the only place that's been looked at is Yucca Mountain in Nevada. And that uh, has no funding and probably is not going to have a hearing. All right, thank you so much, sure. Martin. After Deb speaks um, and we have an opportunity to ask her a few questions, then um, all three of the speakers will sit up front and we will have a facilitated discussion. So we can look at maybe some of these bigger picture questions then. 
Deb Katz, do you need an introduction? <laughs> Deb Katz is the executive director of the Citizens Awareness Network, awesome human being, and um, she is here to talk to us about her experiences at Brogan. Yeah. Well, and more. And uh, Connecticut Yankee. And Connecticut. So, well, what I'm struck by in talking about all of this um, is the abstract notion of it. Because in a certain way, when you talk about things in the abstract, anything is possible. And it all seems reasonable. And it can all work out. And I guess I'm here to tell the tale of what a dirty decommissioning at two reactor sites sort of looks like. So I want to start with the notion that it's in decommissioning that the colossal failure of nuclear power is really demonstrated. Mm -hmm. Because uh, these sites are really toxic waste dumps. They're not just radioactive sites, but they're actually, uh, they have PCB contamination, they have lead contamination, they are toxic. And so the issue of what it takes to clean them up is an enormous task. It's not like cleaning up a potato chip vacuum, even though a lot of times it seems like it might be. You know, when we shut Yankee Row, one of the things we did was we called for the immediate decommissioning. We wanted the stuff out of there right away. And there were reasons we wanted it out of there right away. We have an epidemic of disease in our community. We have a tenfold increase in children with Down syndrome, statistical significance in breast cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, an array of diseases. So that the issue of what Roe had done to us and the radioactive waste they routinely and regularly dumped into the Deerfield River was uh, real and immediate to us. This was not an abstract demonstration of how democracy could work in the cleanup of, of a nuclear reactor. This was the issue of protecting our community. So we wanted that waste out of there right away. And we came to regret it. We came to regret that stance for many reasons. Yankee Atomic actually engaged in a relatively dirty and illegal decommissioning. Um, I want to talk about the colossal failure for a minute in terms of this, and then I'll get to the illegality of Yankee Atomic, which has now sort of set, set the standard for part of decommissioning in America. But Yankee Row, when it was built, cost $39 million to build. This was 1961. It cost over $700 million to clean up. $700 million to clean up. That's the high level waste. That's the waste that's there in terms of radiological issues. And when they closed, they said it'll just be $265 million. And then they came back the next year and said, well, it's $310 million. And then they came back and they said it's $500. And what kept raising the cost is that once they started being forced to look for the contamination underground, that's what raised the cost again and again and again. Because if Tom talked about them going down three feet. Well, the reason they want to go down three feet, not just in terms of the piping, but at Yankee Road, the contamination from tritium went down 300 feet in the ground. 300 feet. And in fact, migrated to the Deerfield River, basically over the years when they had leaks. So this idea of what makes sense, or that they go down three feet or six feet, has nothing to do with reality. Reality has to do with what they actually find and how you can hold energy accountable to actually look. Because decommissioning is really about how dirty can clean up be. Because the fight is always over trying to do less. And Entergy is already exhibiting that, but it, it really goes further. You have a 25 millirem standard in terms of cleanup. But at Yankee Row and Connecticut Yankee, they kept saying background was, you know, over 100 uh, in background. So that actually Connecticut Yankee hardly left anything on the site. 
It was all part of background. It was radon. It was there before they ever existed. And this is the kinds of routines that go on. In fact, Yankee Row will never be released for unrestricted use, besides the fact that it's a high-level waste dump because of PCB contamination. It can never be released. Do you know how many sites have been? I'm not sure that any have been at this point, Gary. Connecticut Yankee has not been released for unrestricted use. Maine Yankee, no. Maine Yankee, no. And all of them, of course, are high-level waste dumps, and some of them are still toxic waste dumps. But I want to talk about the issue. And of course, they, Marvin and uh, Tom have both gone into the decommissioning fund. And we have Entergy that's a merchant plant. There's no place to go back to. And in a certain way, this is an experiment that is now playing out. Because with the deregulation and the breaking up of utilities that took place in the 1990s, where you know the power generators were separated from the transmitting generators, there was this whole idea of the this nightmare of merchant plants coming about. It started in California. The idea was to pay off the bad debt of the nuclear industry, and then they would all close. And instead, what that you had was Entergy and Exelon and other corporations actually gobbling up these nukes, which you see Entergy bought Pilgrim for $25 million, <laughs> plus the new fuel. It uh, bought Vermont Yankee. We forced them to pay more for Vermont Yankee. I'm sure they regret it to this day that they paid more than $25 million for it. But they had to pay almost $200 million for Vermont Yankee. They bought Indian Point. They bought, you know, Fitzpatrick. And, you know, this is a fleet of merchant plants that have no rate base to go back to. And you have to understand with Yankee Row what they did was every time they had an oops and the, the, it went up, they went back to the rate base and said, well, we need more money. We need more money. We need more money. Connecticut Yankee will be paying, Connecticut Power and Light will pay till 2015 for the cleanup of Connecticut Yankee. They are paying for a dead reactor site. They're getting nothing from it, no benefit, but they're having to pay for it. But they ha and they're going to pay, what we found out recently, is that the state of Massachusetts, the ratepayers of Massachusetts and Connecticut are paying about $5 million a year to babysit the high-level waste of each of these. And Entergy has none of this money stream to go back to. There's none. So they are in a very difficult situation between a rock and a hard place themselves. The issue of whether the state can negotiate some deal with them since they need something from the state at this point, which is a certificate of public good, <coughs> has the potential to try to set some limits on how this takes place. But I want to also get back to what we did at work, because we felt that what Yankee Atomic was doing was really dangerous and illegal. I mean, they were they closed in 92. In 2004, they were taking out the steam generators. The steam generators were 300 curies, 400 curies apiece, maybe more. They took them out them just as the steam generators lined with concrete down our roads to the railroad, all the way down to Barnwell, South Carolina. They were, we were concerned with their exposing workers. We actually took them to court because until Yankee wrote, decommissioning was seen as a major federal action. What does that mean? It meant they had to submit like a 300 page decommissioning plan in which they made commitment to after commitment about how they were going to clean the site up. There were NRC inspectors on site. They had to be there. There were EPA inspectors because it being the National Environmental Policy Act, the EPA was involved in the site. There were these commitments and there were hearings in which citizens as well as states could in fact petition, could cross-examine, and we had a very powerful effect in in Massachusetts and Connecticut over this. So we took the NRC to court over this. In the court, there was a point where they asked how Yankee Atomic got permission to strip and ship the reactor. 
And <coughs> the lawyer for the NRC said in a phone call. And the judge said, how did you get permission to strip and sh he, he didn't say strip and ship, that would be fine, to decommission in a phone call. So that what's really important is we won a lawsuit against the NRC in this. We, in fact, got one against the uh, Administrative Procedures Act, the Atomic Energy Act, and the National Environmental Policy Act. And we won. And what happened after we won? Can anyone guess? No, no, something very drastic happened. The NRC changed their rules. Okay, so now they can submit a 12-page document to strip and ship a reactor. There are no written commitments about how they do it. There's no NRC inspectors on site. It's the Wild West at a lot of these sites in terms of what happened. At Connecticut Yankee, in fact, there were workers walking through the spent fuel tunnels. They didn't have masks on. They got exposed to alpha particles, and the NRC actually shut that decommissioning down for a year. So, when we talk about the abstract of how they can clean this up and what a great job they can do, it's actually a very complicated process. So I just want to get to what we see, given that background, what can happen. Because we believe that, that I'm going to show these pictures basically at the end, because they'll just give a sense of, you know, this is the smallest commercial reactor in America being de decommissioned. This was 185 megawatts. If you just, go, yes, just go through a couple of them. And then of that, them taking the buildings. They work 24 hours a day. They worked at night. You can actually, on some of them, see the workers aren't wearing badges. These were actually internal pictures that were taken. The company never shows these. We were given them. There's a woman without badges cleaning the outside of the reactor. As a, and there's a great shot of <laughs> that leg coming down. <laughs> and I show these just because I want to give a sense of what a big job this is, how it's talked about. But it is really a very big job. So we believe that the decommissioning has to be thorough and responsible. You know, and we also believe that decommissioning can start right away. So when we talk about waiting for certain things, we're not talking about waiting to start cleaning things up because Entergy can employ the skilled workforce as soon as they can just continue to work there. One of the things they can do, and we believe the most important thing they need to do is in fact move the high level waste out of the pool and dry cast storage. That is the essential because, you know, when the reactor closes, it's far less dangerous. There is no doubt. But at boiling water reactors, that fuel makes it continue to be dangerous and vulnerable. Because if they have 25 security guards watching it, they're not necessarily going to know if the pool starts to drain. At reactors in the country that have a full staff working, God, it was down on the East Coast, the reactor lost enough water, it was leaking, that there were waves in the pool waves in the pool. And they then tried to come up with the hoses. What were they doing? They were running up seven stories with hoses to get the water in the pool, and the hoses weren't long enough because they had never done it. Mm -hmm. So this is at an operating reactor. Imagine what it's like if there are 25 people on site trying to deal with this. How dangerous this is. I mean, if there is an accent in that pool, or there is the potential the boiling water reactors are the most vulnerable to terrorism. There could be a hundred, you know, 250, 25,000 square miles could be uninhabitable for decades because of an accident or an act of malice at Vermont Yankee in which the fuel pool didn't even completely drain water, but just kept heating up. It's not going to have an explosion. What's going to happen is if the fuel heats up, it's going to give off radiation, like at Fukushima. 
more and more until it consumes the pool. So the first thing that has to happen is that has to move. And what they can do, as Marvin talked about, is commence site surveying of all the contamination, which is essential. And you need the skilled workforce to do that because the skilled workforce has the institutional memory of where all the leaks are, all the accidents that took place, they are the ones that know. And of course, Entergy would, I'm sure, like to get rid of them because then no one will know where the contamination is. And then no one will find it. This, I mean, this is the game that goes on. So the workers have to be employed in site surveying. You know, they have to, they can also start removing the non-essential, <coughs> non-contaminated buildings. There is a lot of work that can take place. But what we talk about waiting to do, and Marvin alluded to it a little, is we believe they have to wait in terms of cutting up the internals. Because the internals are highly con contaminated parts that Marvin was talking about. At Yankee Row in Connecticut Yankee, as they cut up the internals, they released hot particles all over the site. Hot particles. Now, Yankee Row, is a site with 2,000 acres. So when they released high particles, there wasn't anyone around. And Connecticut Yankee is relatively remote in terms of people being around where it is. But there's a school across the street from Vermont Yankee. I mean, it's not in an industrial area separated off. This is in a neighborhood. There's a school across the river. So in, in terms of taking it out of the abstract and looking at who is vulnerable and what is dangerous in this, the notion of them starting to cut the internals when they're still so hot, besides the issue of worker exposure that takes place in this, which is very real, and it rode because we got to see all the internal documents because we won the lawsuit, that they had a lot of exposures by those workers, because the workers didn't understand. The health physicists, Marvin and I both saw it, the health physicists were yelling at the workers, don't stand by the steam generators after you work on it. Move away from the steam generators. And they just did not understand what was even happening to them. So you're talking about the workers, and some people say, wow, you know, they work in it. They deserve what they get. It's not a stance that can takes in all of this. And you have those two elementary schools, and you have a neighborhood. And so the notion of how this gets cleaned up is really an issue of responsibility and being very protective of that community. And then what we have in terms of where the waste goes, because I have to mention it, and it drives people crazy, but where does all of this waste go? The low-level waste, because we're stuck with the high-level waste. I live between two high-level waste dumps. I will never in my lifetime, and probably in Mikey's lifetime, never see that waste move anywhere. But where does what supposedly the low-level waste, where does it go? To Texas. To Texas. Do you think they want our waste? No, they do not. They do not. You know, when Yankee Row sent its waste down to Barnwell, South Carolina, Yankee Row was pictured in the newspapers as carpetbaggers coming in. There are, there are some people who may benefit from that dump, especially, you know, uh, the governor and his pals, but the people, other uh, people in Andrews County do not want this waste. Now, one of the most... <clears throat> painful qualities of dealing with nuclear power is that there are no good solutions. There are only bad solutions and worse ones. And you're always trying to find the best of the worst. And you're also trying to do it in the most moral way you can, because the truth is the waste is going to go to Texas, whether Texans want it or not, because it's a compact that the state of Vermont and Texas have. By also slowing it down somewhat, especially in terms of the internals, the amount of waste that goes to Texas goes down. So the amount of waste that Texas has to deal with and that dump has to deal with is lessened because, in fact, that dump sits on the single source aquifer for the West, the Ogallala Aquifer, which covers the whole West. That's why at Barnwell, which is now closed to the rest of the country because they decided they weren't going to take 
They weren't going to become the toilet for the nuclear industry. There is a hundred acre plume of tritium going down to the single source aquifer. The only argument between the EPA and whoever owns it now, because it was Chem Nuclear, then it was Waste Management Associates, and it's someone else now, they keep switching whoever it is, is how fast it's going to happen. The EPA says it's about, I think it's 20 years, and of course Chem Nuclear says it's at least 60 or 70, and why? Because in 70 years they won't be responsible for it. Now, Barnwell, I was down there. Barnwell is a poor, rural, 46% African-American community. It has a level of poverty that nobody here in this room could imagine what that's like. It's devastating. The original site for the dump in Texas was a community, Sierra Blanco, where the average income was $7,000 a year. There are issues in this of environmental racism and environmental justice that we have to think about. We can't necessarily control it, but we cannot ignore it and act like that is not a responsibility in this. Because I didn't want the waste in my community. I'm four miles from Yankee Road. I'm 16 miles from Vermont Yankee. I also know how it devastated my community. And the notion that it's going to devastate another community just drives me crazy and is really painful in all of this. And there's no easy solution to it. The negotiations that are going on between the Shumlin administration and Entergy are essential at this moment. And whatever the legislature can do in this session is also essential because this is potentially the last opportunity where the state has any traction to negotiate in a way where they can potentially get the fuel moved, which is their high priority in dealing with this. What I want to say is one of the democratic ways we came up with that row, and it's really a dog and pony show in ways, but it created some transparency, is we asked for a citizen advisory board. And it actually has become standard practice, which was that local citizens participated, the utility participated, the state participated. It is a way for democracy to, par to actually happen in this. They, there isn't a lot of control, but it creates con transparency. I think it would be important for there to be blue collar workers as well as white collar workers from Entergy. And it has the ability to at least keep people informed about what's taking place. So. What is important to realize is there is not another merchant plant in America that has been decommissioned. There is Kiwani out in the Midwest, but no one's really watching Kiwani because there wasn't a fight as there has been over the years over this. There hasn't been democracy working the way it is here. So in fact, this is the first merchant plant to decommission. This will set the precedent and you know, the whole world is watching. As Marvin talks about, they can't leave that site contaminated. If they do, the industry is dead. It, there's a lot at stake in this. The industry cannot afford to have a nuclear corporation walk away from a site. If they do, there's no, the, you know, the wet dream of the nuclear industry that they were having a renaissance was, of course, a wet dream. Just one more. But if they actually abandon a site or they leave it where it becomes a super fun site and someone has to pay, that's the end of the industry. It's over. So everyone has a stake in this in a way that goes way beyond our local concerns in a way for the whole of the nuclear industry. So I'm sorry. I would like to make it easy, just damn well ship that bloody thing out of there. And I should say one thing in terms of being able to use the site, that waste is going to be there for decades, if not hundreds of years. There is no place for it to go. And the, it, the, one of the things about it is all of these transmission lines, all of this, which of course we pay for as taxpayers, all of these corporations in some ways want in. Yankee Row, Connecticut Yankee, and Maine Yankee have been bought up for almost half of their assets by Iberdola and National Grid. And why do you think that is? 
You think they want to go into the high-level waste business? They're going to really enjoy that? They're imagining they're going to get, I don't know, billion dollars worth of free infrastructure to eventually build power. And the same may be true at Vermont Yankee, but it's the least desirable because it's the smallest in terms of being able to do it. But that's still a long way off. So. All right. Thank you. And I just want to give a little context to the rest of our discussion, kind of going off of what Tom said. Um, about we've got Congress, we've got the grassroots, we've got everything in between. We've got all of this information, some of which leaves me feeling like we're between a rock and a hard place. Um, and and how do we make our voices heard when there is not one one message? There is not one single message. Um, so I just kind of want to put that out to frame, to frame our conversation. What do we do? Take what do we do with all of this information we we just learned? So take a seat, guys. Well, I answer the two questions that I heard um, real quick. Uh, there was a question first about the property taxes paid by Velco and Vermont Yankee. Um, WRC was commissioned to create a resiliency action plan for the town of Vernon. So we, we were commissioned by Vernon to do that. We produced that plan using their data. Vermont Yankee in the year 2011 to 2012 paid $1,147,000 plus in property taxes, while Velco, Velco paid $1,174,000 in taxes. So a little bit more from Velco. Not a lot, but a little bit more. Uh, and the other question was about how to see what the fund is, what, how it's invested. Um, if you are able to find um, an exhibit, a discovery exhibit produced by uh, Entergy, it's discovery exhibit DPS colon EN-2-57.1 and .2. You probably won't remember that, but if you hit me up today, I've got it written down so I can scratch it for you and send it to you by email. And I would just say that at Yankee Row, in fact, it's a hydroelectric dam, Bear Swamp, and they have contributed to Row as well in terms of it. So that Row was not left with with nothing in terms of Row was actually a town that was in much worse shape than Burn and Chad, I think. So uh, a question that came to my mind, uh, most everyone talked about um, getting going towards the Department of Energy and um, getting reimbursed for long-term waste management. So the question that's in my mind is, is there a fund that exists currently um, that is being used to pay those reimbursements? Uh, knowing that Energy is, is uh, or Envy is estimating $365 million for long-term waste management, is that correct? Is that the number that was up? I have to look um, it up, but 366 strikes in my mind. Yeah, something like there about it. So uh, one is, is there a current fund that's being used, um, um, that's being managed by the Department of Energy? Um, and then what's the long term um, in terms of where that money is coming from? And my question is essentially, um, are taxpayers, is new tax revenue, <coughs> meaning us as taxpayers, going to be paying additional funds to this management uh, of long-term waste? Why don't you start, um, Mark? Well, I have two answers to this. First of all, there is a fund. Uh, utilities have contributed to this fund. I forget the exact amount that's in it, on the order of $11 billion or something like that is in, is in the fund. Uh, and that's what the Department of Energy pays out uh, and that's also supposed to take care of, you know, all the, the rest of what's going to happen to this nuclear fuel. Uh, it, it, it's clearly inadequate, but there is a fund. Uh, the second uh, point I want to make is, but a court in D.C. Uh, uh, last week, or 
what, November, I don't know, mid-November, uh, said utilities no longer have to put money into that fund. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's nowhere they're going to take the fuel, so why should mm -hmm. utilities pay for nothing? That's essentially what the, the court decided. So there is a fund, but there no longer is any contribution to that fund. So, and in, in help me with the math here, because this is not my strong suit, but if Envy is estimating 365 million, and I'm just going to throw out, to make it really easy, 100 reactor sites across the country. I know that's low, but being very conservative here, that's 365 <coughs> billion. Correct? And you say there's X amount of funds, 10 billion thereabouts in this fund right now that can no longer be added yeah. to by utilities. And almost 11 so, billion has already been put into this right. hole, hole in the ground at Yucca Mountain. Right. right. So my question is, is new tax revenue going to have to be generated in order to pay that 300 and some billion dollar hole? And again, this is just a, off the top of my head numbers, but we're talking about the billions and not a couple of million shortfall. Um, can I weigh in on that? Sure. Um, I understand the numbers a little bit differently, okay. um, and I might be wrong about this. I haven't studied it in, in detail. Uh, as I understand it, the utility has been paying based on how much nuclear power they produce. So they pay into this big fund. And that fund is supposed to handle the eventual disposal of the waste. Department of Energy is in breach of its contract. They've been sued by the utilities to take this fuel away or cover the cost of its maintenance on site. It's my understanding that that money, the settlement money, the reimbursement money, is coming out of taxpayer funds and is not coming out of the uh, spent fuel management fund. Uh, I could be wrong about that. So my understanding of that money is very different. Okay. Because they violated the contract. Yankee Atomic was the first to sue on that basis and set the precedent for so, getting reimbursed for setting up dry cases. So do you understand that that money is coming from the Treasury rather than the... I think so, because it's the, the federal government abdicating its responsibility to actually yeah. have a, a plan which they committed to having by the time the reactor closed. So I'm so. nodding because... I'm I glad think so, that you yeah. agree, I not because so, yeah. it's good. No, it's not good at all. But <laughs> so we're, we're paying for yeah. it. Okay. Um, but that means that the fund itself should be secure to pay for the eventual disposal of the fuel should that ever happen. Whether that fund is sufficient to do that is a whole other question. Okay. Thank you. Gary, you have a question? Yeah. Um, are there any you known cancer clusters in Vernon? <clears throat> I don't, I do not know. I have not gotten any information on it. The cancer registry in Vermont was started not that long ago, and I, I don't have statistics. I mean, because word of mouth says there is, if you talk to people in Vernon. Um, so when you mentioned uh, what went on around Roe, and the instances of conditions. I just thought if there would be any way to track that, well, find that, either in Stale or Vernon, what what, what happened at Roe was mothers with children with Down syndrome came to CAN and said they experienced being blown off by the state of Massachusetts. They're not dealing with the, uh, the number of children. There were at least 10 children with Down syndrome in a valley of 6,000 people. Mm -hmm. It's a very high statistic, but the state wasn't doing anything, and we got involved, and in fact, we were in a health study with the state for eight years over the issues of disease in, in the community, and we brought in <coughs> epidemiologists, we brought in Harvard School of Public Health, USGS, and, and actually had people who had set up the cancer registry in Massachusetts work on it. Massachusetts is the only state that has done three health studies on radiation in which they have found statistical significance in cancer at each of these sites. And, but they couldn't ever prove anything. It's like uh, the gun melted, you know, but everyone's lying dead on the ground, but they can't find the weapon anymore. Mm -hmm. 
And nothing ever changed as a result of those things. Well, I think something did for the parents of the children with Down syndrome. I mean, in that cluster, one of the fathers died of a brain tumor at 39 years of age. Two of the mothers had breast cancer. Two others had, um, oh, it, it, it just was for all the people who were sick in the community. The study was very validating that it wasn't just that they ate too much bacon or smoked one too many cigarettes, but that in fact they were really impacted by what had been dumped in the river. So in that sense, it was very powerful. But it takes a lot of work and it's very, very hard. And you know, after we found all these statistics, the next time we looked at the statistics from Massachusetts, they incorporated all the statistical significance as the norm. So it was no longer statistically significant anymore. You know, this is just a numbers game. And so then it still jumped up, but it was not statistically significant. But if they stayed with the original numbers, then it would have really skyrocketed. And this is in the population of 8,000 people. Yeah, uh, we've got other questions. Daniel? Uh, Deb, you, s you sounded pretty confident that <clears throat> if Entergy uh, didn't do a jo good job of cleaning up that would reflect really badly on <clears throat> the nuclear industry as a whole. And I mean, knowing what they get away with it as it is, I mean, where, did, where does that come from? Well, <laughs> where does it come from? Well, I think just like Entergy has this need to get that certificate of public good right now. I mean, in one sense, you could say, why are they even bothering? Yeah, why are they bothering? They've been, you know, such bastards <laughs> they can just blow it off. But in terms of their shareholders and their stock, which has been, you know, going down like crazy, they're financially a sinking ship at this point. I mean, this is part of the struggle, which is important to understand. Entergy is losing was estimated to lose over $125 million operating Vermont Yankee till 2016. And that was operating 24-7 with no downtime for repairs. They are in terrible financial shape, and they are at Fitzpatrick, and they are at Pilgrim. Their being in such terrible shape makes them very vulnerable in all of this and vulnerable to their shareholders and to the industry. The industry has a need to keep nuclear power going. And if a reactor goes bankrupt or walks away from its obligations, um, it just is terrible in terms of what it will look like, in, in terms of the notion of them being able to sell America on another 20 or 40 years, which at this point they're still trying to do. Yeah, um, I disagree a little bit because I think Entergy's obligation from their standpoint and from an industry standpoint is to decommission at the end of the 60-year period. The NRC gives them that 60 right. years, they expect to use it. What happens in the next 10 or 15 years, I don't think reflects badly on the industry, as long as Entergy can comfortably roll it into safe store and keep it going at least that long. It puts the damage off to the end. So I think that's their game. Uh, the, the harm to, or the risk to Entergy here is that the Public Service Board or the legislature may require something sooner. And now they've got an obligation to put money up. That's where it can hurt them. So they're trying to negotiate a delay tactic here, um, which would effectively help the industry. I, I guess what I also see is I don't know if Entergy is going to be there in 20 years. See, I, that, see, I'm actually looking at the longer haul, which is they may, Enron disappeared. I think it can be very likely that Entergy will disappear. And this has been unprecedented, that there's nothing like this that has happened in the industry where a corporation that has owned a nuke has, well, it did, Amergen, which we fought <laughs> the state of Vermont from allowing them to buy Vermont Yankee, and they went down the tubes. But, you know, <clears throat> they were rescued by other nuclear corporations, which saved them from looking really terrible. But I, I'm looking at it in that light, which is that, will Entergy really even be around? We have a question back here, a man in red. Uh, Three or four very brief points about decommissioning. Um, 
Madigan Yankee and Maine Yankee are excellent precedents for uh, rapid decommissioning that we all could uh, perhaps make uh, a good use of here. Um, Mike, just to point out, there's another decommissioning panel next Sunday, and Ray Shaddis will be there, and he will be talking specifically on Maine Yankee decommissioning. Yes, but do you mind if I continue? No, not at all. I'm, I just okay. was looking for a opportunity to make that little pitch. Oh, sure. <laughs> and you gave me one. Sure, fine. Uh, no offense. Uh, because uh, in, in case, uh, j j just to review, it shut down in 96, as for decommissioning again in 1998, Connecticut Yankee, it was finished in 2007. I quote, Connecticut Yankee chose immediate dismantlement, the decon method, because it was the most practical and environmentally responsible option for the plant. Other considerations included the use of current plant employees who were trained and knowledgeable about the facility, prevention of long-term maintenance costs, and the availability of low-level waste storage facilities. Similarly, at uh, Vermont Yankee, uh, they mentioned that uh, they, they did the decommissioning in uh, three years. It shut down in, uh, in 1997. Okay, they waited five years until 2002. They were done by 2005. Uh, they 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 did it. They they cleaned it. It says here, I quote, uh, cleaned radiologically to a level significantly more stringent than that required by the NRC. And a hallmark of their decommissioning was stakeholders working together toward a site restoration second to none. Now, whether or not this is public relations, I don't know, but it certainly could be uh, an excellent slogan for uh, for us. I also would add one final point, and that is regarding SafeStore. We are not being told uh, what SafeStore actually is. It is a, a safety standard, that's all it is, of the United Nations International Atomic Energy Agency. And there are actually two options for SafeStore, and I'm going to quote here. This is from their, from their brochure, Safe Enclosure of Nuclear Facilities During Deferred Dismantling, 2002, page Is there a question 13. coming up? <laughs> The active option for safe enclosure of the facility is characterized by allowing entry at all times, having dedicated personnel to survey the facility and environmental conditions during the entry <coughs> period, and keeping the equipment and systems operational during the safe enclosure period. The essential feature of the passive option is the fact that the site is not staffed for the majority of the safe enclosure period, but only during periods of inspection and maintenance. In answer, to the question, in answer to the question that was asked, no, a question is not being raised. A concern is being raised, which is, uh, it, it seems fairly obvious that what energy envisions is the passive option of safe store, where, I quote again, the site is not staffed for the majority of the safe enclosure period, but only during periods of inspection and maintenance. That sounds pretty dangerous, because what's going to go on during that time? Okay, I quote again. Significant safety issues arise from potential failure of barriers used to confine radioactive material, unidentified areas of significant contamination, new or unrecognized waste streams, spread of contamination <coughs> during maintenance well, sir, and security activities, we're deterioration of building structures, and component components which may have, have an impact on safe there. worker access or on final dismantling. Potential impact of non-radiological -radi component failure. I'll be happy to address the question if you like. Yeah. What's now, the question? I don't think there is. It is, it is not a question, it is a concern. I am suggesting to you that the concern for all of us is that energy is clearly going to attempt to, do, to go to passive safe store. And if they do, basically they're going to drop in occasionally to be sure that everything is okay. And yet the International Atomic Energy Agency lists and I have, uh, and I have just quoted well, a whole you know, bunch we, of things. That everyone happen. here, this this um, this evening, this panel was created specifically to talk about what the alternatives to South Store are. I don't think that any of us here are proponents of, of it, nor are we here to even discuss why it's not. We're just taking it as a given. We don't really have enough time to talk about why it's bad. We're just starting from a basis of what are our other alternatives and we're talking about what the alternatives are to that process tonight. So I had a couple of other yeah, things. Did you have real quick? Quick? <laughs> yeah, um, I want to address what Safe Store is real quick um, because the, the presentation you just offered is one of 
closing the gate and just letting it be there with no people. Mm -hmm. And that's not what Entergy yeah. has in mind. That's not what the NRC will allow. Uh, there must be security on staff. Right. There must be monitoring on staff. There must be engineers on staff. If you look through their decommissioning cost analysis, uh, their budget for decommissioning, it will tell you how many man hours are required during the safe store period, uh, year by year, and what those man hours do in terms of the type <coughs> of labor that's involved. So I'm really comfortable looking at that and believing that Entergy actually plans to have people there doing their jobs. Not a lot, but it's there. So if there are two different types of safe store, Entergy is looking for the one that's managed, that's overseen on a daily, regular basis. Um, and the other question you had, or the other issue that I heard, um, was Maine Yankee uh, and the, the rapid way they were able to decommission. Um, Maine Yankee was owned by ratepayer utilities, so they could charge those costs back to the ratepayer. <coughs> Vermont Yankee is a merchant plant, it can't do that. That's a huge difference mm -hmm. in what we do as we move forward into, into the process. Thank you. Nancy Brown, did you have well, a question? I just, I just wanted to follow through on one thing, because it's something that I've just been persistently kind of curious about, you know, in my insomniac brain, I've been thinking, you know, what happens when and if Entergy does throw in the towel? I mean, A, you know, looking at all of, I knew in it, you know, previously about, you know, their LLCs on top of their LLCs on top of their LLCs, and I, you know, it really feels like a very strong possibility that Entergy will throw in the towel and say, you know, this particular, even if the whole company doesn't go belly up, that this particular part of the company, I mean, the chances, I'd say the chances that it will exist in 60 years are probably, you know, l probably less than that I will exist in 60 years. <laughs> and I'm not living to 120, I know that. So, you know, I, I just really would like to know, does anybody actually, none of the people that are in authority and actually have any kind of say over this are looking into this nobody, and speculating? Nobody has dealt with this before. That's why this is such an experiment. There has not been a merchant plant that has been in this position where there is no rate base to go back to. It has not happened in terms of either operating or in terms of cleanup. So that this is really an experiment at this moment. One of the things I can say that, um, that gives you a sense of who Entergy is, every night Entergy moves all of its funds all of its funds to the Cayman Islands. <laughs> Every night. Every night. They're making more money. It doesn't matter. They move all of their funds to the Cayman Islands and they bring them back the next day. But this is the notion of how this corporation. Is. Well, the, let me say that there are nuclear facilities, though, that have gone belly up. And where. Uh, the state or federal taxpayers have had to take, you know, had a role in actually cleaning them up. The one I'm most familiar with is West Valley, where uh, they put $32 million into the plant to build it. It got back $21 million in revenue, and the cost to clean it up is now on the order of $5 billion, uh, and w of which the state has to pay 10%. So the state is going to pay uh, on the order of $500 million in the end to actually clean up this, uh, this facility. And the feds are paying the rest? What? You said the state's paying 10%, so the federal, the DOE is paying the rest? Yes, 90%. Is us. It's all us. Another facility I'm familiar with is uh, a facility in Texas that uh, dealt with nuclear materials, and they just walked. They went bankrupt and walked away. Uh, and. The effect of that was that the EPA had to come in uh, and clean it up. So that, again, was uh, federal taxpayers that had to clean it up. I'm going to split that into two components, the nuclear side and the site restoration mm -hmm. side. Uh, I'm relatively comfortable that if Entergy bellies up, that the NRC will, through the federal government, handle the radiological component uh, to their standards of safety. But they won't do anything for site restoration. The NRC isn't concerned with that. So that's the piece that would fall to the state of Vermont. Peter Cooper, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, Deb, you mentioned that the, um, the Shulman administration is negotiating with 
dy, uh, and that dy needs a certificate of public good. And I'm puzzled as to why do they need that? Well, they, I think part of it is they need the legitimacy of it. I mean, they're operating in a certain way illegally at this point. They, and that is not a very good position for a corporation to be as, uh, as energy. They need that certificate and they want it. And it's very clear that the day after they announced closure, they made the decision to ask for this abbreviated process. So this is important to them on some legal standing that has meaning. And it also gives the state traction in terms of trying to negotiate at least some basics in terms of cleanup, <coughs> given the fact that, and it's really true, Entergy is in a terrible position. They are between a rock and a hard place, which puts us between a rock and a hard place. In the end, in the end the, though, nothing may happen. Right. Uh, there may be, they, yeah. they may never make a decision all the way to the, when the plant closes down. That's a possibility. It's, but it's unlikely. The chances are somewhere in the new year, the state will come up with directives and conditions on getting the CPG. And whether Entergy accepts them because it's been negotiated already, you know, with these negotiations that are going on, so what is determined that would be reasonable that they can agree on, or at that point, energy goes back to court, I mean, which it could, in fact, do, and that will be a statement of what we can all look forward to for the next 40 Christmases. Well, in another 10 days, we're actually going to have some clarity on this, uh, because they, they put off a de deci any decision-making until uh, this negotiation takes place, and then there may be an announcement in another 10 days as to what's actually happening. The Department of Public Service has filed a note with the right. Public Service Board advising them that they're in negotiations and they will have a, a filing for them on or before December 11th. So the Public Service Board is most likely waiting for that filing, which will give us all a sense of where the negotiations are. So that's our next kind of waypoint in the process. I want to ask you three knowledgeable people for um, some ideas about um, uh, constructive approach. Uh, in the nuclear weapons freeze campaign uh, in the 1980s, uh, Randall Forsberg uh, was a stroke of her genius to decide to take an issue that no one would engage with because there was too much denial and avoidance, too many negatives. Like you said, uh, no positive option. The, the least bad of all the bad. And she turned it on its head and said, what if both the, the Soviet Union and the United States both freeze the production and deployment of nuclear weapons? I believe this movement needs that kind of an image of what the most positive outcome can be. Because that's what we need to organize around. You'll never get thousands of people organizing around fear. Right. And fear alone, it will never happen. Well, what are your What are your images of what is the best possible outcome? <clears throat> I would like for there to be a positive outcome with Entergy. I'm not a fanatic in this. So what so, would your so, positive outcome be? Well, that they can negotiate and get the fuel out of the pool. This is the first thing that's essential. That in fact they do site surveying. That they in fact not just leave the site for that period of time but make a commitment whether it's to 20 years or whatever it is to to be able to do this you know potentially depending on finances but i think there is a way that they can make it easier on energy and it doesn't have to be adversarial necessarily and i do have a hope that that may be possible in these negotiations because it, um, Entergy wants, you know, there isn't a, you, you talk about 60 years and a corporation holding on to these sites. The reason that Connecticut Yankee and Yankee Row stripped and shipped their reactors is they wanted to get out from under having this onerous site, you know. At Rancho Seco, what they found was when they left it in safe store, it cost more because 
roofs blew off of buildings, all sorts of problems happened. And they went, in fact, to start really, in fact, it was described by TLG before Entergy bought them as decommissioning as a hobby, in which they just had the workers start cleaning up because there wasn't anything to do. Rancho Sokyo is actually a very good example of how to go about doing it. We are so, not 60 years. Margaret, what would your equivalent of the nuclear freeze be in this situation? I if you had, it, if you had a message, a positive outcome that was a message, what would you see it as? Well, I don't differ from uh, Deb on this point. Uh, I, I would like them to start decommissioning in five years. At Rancho Seco, they waited eight years before they started decommissioning. We don't differ very much on that particular point. Um, I, I share Deb's concern about, you know, the finances and uh, the likelihood that these companies will exist. Uh, the risk is uh, very high for a company that uh, is just a merchant plant and doesn't have rate payers. So I, I share uh, Deb's concern about that as well. Look, you're not going to organize people around that, though. You need a positive outcome, an image that you can move forward to the people that you want to organize, saying this is what we're striving for. And a bunch of, uh, of high-level radioactive waste sitting in dry casts on the banks of the Connecticut River is not that. Yes, but you can organize taxpayers if they're going to, if they were, taxes are going to go up if they have to pay for this junk. Well, you yeah, know, that's going to be a... Uh, one way of looking at it. Okay. So for some of us, it was quite an education. I appreciate very much uh, what I learned tonight. Um, but this example, for I'm more of a novice than probably a lot of the people in this room to know uh, these different um, reactors where they are. So, but is that last one that you mentioned is that in California? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So is Sacramento. that the model that we should be going? Towards and it's a good that, model. What they, they, so what does right. that look like now? What goes on there it's in your now? Brochure, isn't it? It's actually you, we have it in the brochure. We talk about in our fact sheet what Rancho Seco is doing, so that they they actually have been doing a thorough cleanup. They are a, a utility. It was closed by the will of the people. They began the most progressive approach to sustainable energy. I mean, this is part of it. They gave everyone fluorescent light bulbs at the time. They replaced their inefficient refrigerators with energy efficient refrigerators. They set up wind. They set up solar on site. They actually got into the business of supporting electric cars. I mean, they have transformed themselves from a nuclear corporation or a utility into something that is looking progressively about the future and how to create efficiency and sustainable energy. I mean, that's one of, if you're talking about a positive thing mm -hmm. yeah. that can happen from it, it's what Rancho Seco did. It's now taken as for granted everyone, you know, your utility is going to give you fluorescent bulbs. But it was Rancho Seco that started all of that. And that's, in fact, a a wonderful model because of it. I was just raising my hand because um, part of the reason I think this uh, discussion is really compelling is because I actually read Emory Lovin's book that's on this topic. So if anybody is interested in in this model, you can go on Amazon and uh, Emory Lovin's the guy who's uh, Rocky Mountain Institute. He co-authored a book where they tell the entire story of this, What's the including the con Oh, I knew you were going to answer that. <laughs> and my phone is dead. But, but anyway, the author is, right. he has this hilarious name, A-M-O-R-Y, last name yeah, Lovins, L-O-V-I-N-S. So you just go on <coughs> Amazon and you can find the book that he co-authored right. on this. And, they, and it's spelled out in detail. Or, or you can go to everyone's book. Yes, go to everyone's book. Uh, so, uh, it's, it's old book. Uh, I, I, um, I, I'm still not understanding the leverage we have. Um, before the Public Service Board, I mean, all they have to do is, well, I mean, our, is, is our total power saying, you got to shut down now rather than 10 months from now, and uh, therefore it's going to be so devastating to you, you're going to do whatever we want? 
Yeah. What, 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 do they need Public Service Board approval to continue in decommissioning? So they, all they need is to, to be able to operate until sometime next this time next year when they say they're going to close, isn't it? Right. They need that permission, which is important to them in terms of not operating as a rogue corporation. But they've already proven that they're, they're willing to be a rogue corporation. Plus, plus what what they can do, and you know it, is they'll just take it to court. I don't, I don't say, think the being... public service board is going to say close now. I think what the public service board would do, depending on the negotiations, is put conditions on this period of continued operation. Right. Not necessarily, maybe in terms of thermal pollution is one thing, which would be really important to all of us if they stop that, but also in terms of how they begin the process of cleanup. There are commitments they made in that MOU in terms of cleanup. The state did agree to safe store in that, but there are commitments in terms of site cleanup that are there. The state could also set stricter standards. The state only has a 20 milliram standard at this point where the federal government has 25. At Yankee Row we, and Massachusetts, we had a 10 milliram standard. Connecticut had around a 10 milliram standard. That's a big difference in terms of cleanup. There are these issues that can come up in it. I, I, I'm just going to finish up. Yeah. But I mean, that, that's tr I, get, I get all that. We could get that. And they could also say, we don't want to do that. And we have no leverage. Because all they have to do is say, um, we'll take you to court. We'll get an injunction. It'll be December 2014. Mm -hmm. And you have no jurisdiction over us anyway. Maybe. It's true. Is they, that your Tom's response to that? Yeah. Um, the first, I think what Deb is talking about is the Public Service Board could issue onerous conditions mm -hmm. that Entergy would hate. Mm -hmm. and so Entergy would like to negotiate something to make right. that easier so they don't get hit by conditions from the board. Um, your point about tying it up in court is a good one. Mm -hmm. um, the state is very worried about uh, litigation here uh, regarding preemption. They are not supporting a lot of things that I think we would like in the Public Service Board process now uh, because they're afraid of preemption challenges. So that's a fear and that's a place where the, the alphabet antis, the, the NECs and VPERGs and such can have a separate voice. So the Department of Public Service will come up with this MOU and they'll present it to the board the board has said very clearly recently, you can't present us with a bilateral agreement and accept, expect mm -hmm. us to accept it. There are other parties here. Mm -hmm. So you all will have a voice through those, those other parties. That's important. Which then happens in the latter part of December, into January, into February. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other, piece there, the other piece there is that they've been operating without a certificate for quite a while yeah, now. And the yeah. Public Service Board could yeah, conceivably make these conditions retroactive. Yeah. That's right. what WRC has asked for, and that's right. a concern for right. energy. Good. Okay. That's important. And is it the state legislature that has to approve a pad additionally for additional? Yes. Um, a so very, so. very interesting issue there. Yeah. Um, maybe not. Maybe um, not. Well, the legislature, not. yes. The, the legislature. Board, that's maybe what I said, the legislature. But, but if they, they have to go back to the legislature that has, they have alienated, right. <clears throat> then these are difficult situations, you see, for Entergy as well in terms of this. That's why Entergy, because they need a second pad and they will have to go to the legislature, that, but it's not clear there are issues with it, that they also have reasons. They can't empty the pool without the second pad. They are, they are tied up in some ways as well, having alienated everyone in the state that there are things that they need and that's why this is a potent time to attempt to find some middle ground if it's possible. Okay. I, I want to say I, I agree with you mm -hmm. that they have little leverage. Uh, you know, it, the only leverage is embarrassment, it sounds like to me. Uh, they get, I, I'm concerned that the company will actually just go bankrupt, envy well, yeah. itself. Yeah. Just go bankrupt and say, okay, here's the money, goodbye. I've got a question here. If they're so hard up for money, um, what's to incentivize them to keep workers on that aren't like mm -hmm. greenhorns and the lowest of the low paid 
who are barely out of school, barely educated, who don't really care, and then should we still be concerned, which I would be, is the warm water coming out of the plant into the river, which we haven't talked about. And I think they can all go belly. I mean, they can go belly up, and then the whole industry can go belly up, and then they'll just find something else. Um, I would question or I would I would object to your characterization of the employees as uneducated greenhorns. No, I didn't say they are. She said they are going to be. I don't I don't think they will. I don't think they can. They need good workers there. Uh, the money to pay those workers will ultimately come out of the decommissioning trust fund. I don't think Energy cares what that costs. Um, I, I feel confident that the workforce will be a good workforce, straight through. Well, I'm not so confident for other reasons. Well, you've seen it. I've time. seen it, first of all, and, and they're not necessarily protected. It's also that there is the potential, especially at this point and even later, for the workforce to be really intimidated because they're very vulnerable in terms of bringing up safety issues at this point because Entergy, in fact, I'm sure is cutting as many corners as they can as they're in this time. Workers are going to have to leave to work in other places. They don't want to be known as troublemakers because it would be very hard for them to find jobs. So there are issues now for the workers that make this a very difficult situation for them and also for the workers who will be employed you know, after closure. And they will need workers to remove the fuel from, you know, in the control rods. There's a bunch of work that workers will continue to have to do once it closes. But, but probably the better workers, the ones who can actually right. find jobs elsewhere, will. will. Yeah. Well, with that in mind, Entergy has, um, has said they're going to take a charge against their earnings of 55 to $60 million associated with uh, severance and retention. So they're putting a lot of money right, into right. keeping the, the right. people they want to keep uh, for when they need them. So and that's one of the reasons I'm comfortable short term at least. And Entergy actually owns a decommissioning company of their own. <laughs> and Entergy true. is the one that Maine Yankee had come in and decommissioned Maine Yankee. So Entergy has an experience, has experience with decommissioning. And they have their own division, so. Clay, do you have a I think this is a positive note that might be near the end of the evening, I'm not sure. Um, and I'll just read it rather than describing what it is. Um, and it's a press release that I would have sent out earlier, but you're going to hear it first before it makes it out there. Interveners to the Public Service Board, don't let the State House uh, negotiations ambush the process. Is this concern? It's good that they're negotiating, but where is your voice? in that process. Late Monday afternoon, New England Coalition filed its reply to the Department of Public Services November 22nd request that the Public Service Board hold off making a decision on a certificate of public good for extended operation. The Coalition specifically asked the Board in consideration of all that the parties had invested that the Board give no undue deference to any memorandum of understanding or agreement to which the parties, all of the parties, are not in universal or global agreement. And then further, that the board provide a comment period for the parties on any agreement or memorandum that is put before it that does not carry the signed agreement of all of the parties. So I don't know if that made sense hearing it the first time through, but essentially, the coalition is saying, if the state and energy are making a deal, when they present that deal, everyone that's been part of the proceeding, all of the, the citizens groups needs to sign off on that. Um, or, or, yeah, I'll leave it at that. So that's good. It's not because a few weeks ago you had expressed, you know, frustration that, well, people in Montpelier are talking behind closed doors and we're, how are we a part of that? So this is so, what the NEC is proposing. Yeah, and, and I'll add a little bit more to that. Um, in this process, all the parties filed initial briefs. Then Entergy announced their closure. We filed reply briefs. The board 
wanted to hear one more round of replies. They wanted to hear us comment. And one of the things they said in their request for those comments was that they were concerned that Entergy and the Department of Public Service had together arranged for uh, or agreed to an extension of a deadline without talking to the other parties. And the Public Service Board said, every party here is an equal. So what NEC is saying now is, is Public Service Board, you recognized us as equals. If you get an agreement between these two, please keep that in mind. We are equals. And I think the mm -hmm. board sees that and will accept that. How much historical record is there for that? Uh, very detailed. Not, but not much in terms of the history, in terms right. of energy, and backroom deals with the Department of Public Service. Usually what the Department of Public Service finds and agrees to with the licensee gets pushed right through to law, you, historically, I, I in my experience. I've been on this case now for six years, and I've watched a change in the Public Service Board. Um, I think six years ago, they were deferential to agreements between the Department and Entergy. I think now they're very suspicious right. of that. Yeah. Um, the Public Service Board is very frustrated with what's happened uh, and the, the way that their time has been used. So I, I think they're going to take it very seriously. Maybe I'm naive, but that's what I'm looking for. That's what I keep saying. Yeah, um, I just wanted to thank Ray Shadis, who um, did the uh, help decommission Maine, uh, Maine Yankee, who's going to give a talk in Brattleboro. And the talk is on Monday, um, the 8th, at Center Congregational. Ninth. Ninth, on Monday the 9th, at Center Congregational Church in Brattleboro. There will be a film show that details all about the decommissioning of Maine Yankees. So um, again, I think I think the email's gone out on that, but if you're interested, you know, just call the coalition office to give you details. So we are running about 15 minutes over the time that we were to close. Um, and it was a crazy thing we could do this in two hours. Um, I'm sure some of us could sit here for another hour, but some of us have other obligations and long drives to make. Um, a lot to think about. Please think about it. Please um, grab one of these flyers, because just sitting here and learning and talking with your friends um, is not really going to do anything. We don't all want to be, you know, just the, what is it called, the couch, armchair. couch activists, what, armchair activists. Um, and something that hasn't been talked about very much this evening is what's going on in Congress. So I'm going to take just a minute to, to kind of cap the evening with that. Um, Bernie Sanders is actually on the NRC, one of the NRC oversight committees. Um, and Ed Markey, who's from um, Massachusetts, has been doing a phenomenal job working on NRC issues for decades. Um, so now he's in the Senate, Markey is. And um, in the last a couple of weeks, Markey and Sanders have worked together on a number of issues. One of them is directly related to um, finances. Right. Um, Deb Katz's organizations and a couple other organizations representing energy reactors um, said to the NRC, you know, we're really worried about their finances. The NRC, shockingly enough, said, you know, you've got a good point there. Oh, come on. They did. They, did. they said, they we're going to look at their finances. Petition. They accepted their petition. They said, Angie, we want you to open your books. We want to look at your books. They hadn't thought about it. And then what happened was that um, the higher ups they in the NRC. changed the rules at the NRC. No, no, they didn't change the rules. The higher ups at the NRC the senior said, executives you can never <laughs> ask for financial information ever on any nuclear corporation. Not just energy now. Energy actually went to the NRC, the higher ups, and met with them and said, this cannot happen. And, and they were denied access. And then right. the other thing that happened was that the NRC changed who has access right. to any information right. of the NRC. Originally, if you were a congressman or a congresswoman right. and there was a reactor in your state, you could go to the NRC and ask them for information, regardless of whether you were on a committee that had oversight over the NRC or not. 
now, and if you were on an oversight committee, if you are one of our elected congressmen like Bernie Sanders, and you were on the oversight committee, you could go to the NRC and ask them for information. Now, the NRC changed the rules without even speaking to Congress about it, without even speaking to the, their oversight committee. They said now only if you're the chair of the oversight committee or a ranking member of the oversight committee can you go can you ask even ask the NRC for information. Barbara Boxer, who's the chair of the Public Health and Environment Committee, Public Works and Environment Committee, her staff was denied information about San Onofre, and they were told that they um, her staff could be searched before leaving the NRC building to make sure that they hadn't tried to sneak out any documents. So the NRC is completely snubbing their noses at Congress. I mean, we're used to it. We're used to being, you know, the state being treated like this. But now they're treating the U.S. Congress this way. If you can, I'm feeling a little passionate about this myself. So, One of the things we want are congressional hearings the issue of uh, the NRC not being able to look at the financial records, especially of these merchant plans, which are all in financial trouble. And it's really, to me, the, this, this relationship of the nuclear corporations and the NRC completely epitomizes what's wrong right now with the relationship of corporations Five, six, and our democracy. Nine. It's just such a perfect example of how things are going really awry. So, uh, and Bernie Sanders is not being public about this. He's signing letters with Mark Hain and everything, but he's, he's not saying anything. So there's, please, there's their right. press release. Yeah, there's yeah, their press release. release. And they've got um, addresses on so here. Please public. write to Bernie. Right. Please um, ask for congressional hearings. Ask for hearings. Take one of these calls. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you.